The text for the sermon this afternoon is the Word of God, as we have it summarized. In the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 39. Lord's Day 39 is about the fifth commandment. The fifth commandment reads as follows. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. On honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And then we confess the Church of Jesus Christ in Lord's Day 39. What does God require in the fifth commandment? That I show all honor, love, and faithfulness to my father and mother, and to all those in authority over me. Submit myself with due obedience to their good instruction and discipline, and also have patience with their weaknesses and shortcomings, since it is God's will to govern us by their hand. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, the first four commandments of the Ten Words of the Covenant teach us how we are to live in relation to God. And now we have come to the second part of the Ten Commandments, which teaches us what duties we owe our neighbor. It is not surprising that the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, begins this second part of the law. Just like the first commandment is foundational for a proper understanding of the rest of the first part of the law, because it states the requirement to serve the Lord God alone, so also the fifth commandment is critical for the rest of the commandments. For only when the proper God-given authorities are honored and obeyed will society be able to flourish. When the authorities are obeyed, then the evils of murder, adultery, theft, and false witness will be curbed, restrained, and punished. For the Lord has set up the institutions of family, church, government, and other authorities so that his good laws will be taught and lived by. Let us this afternoon consider what God Require us from us in the fifth commandment. I proclaim to you God's word under the following theme. Honor your father and your mother in the Lord. We will see first the meaning of this commandment and second the promise of this commandment. Honor your father and your mother. What does it mean to honor someone? Honoring someone is not exactly the same as loving them or seeking their best interest. As God's children, we are called to love everyone, even our enemies. But we are not called upon to honor everyone. To honor someone is the special duty we owe to those God has placed in authority over us. It means to consider their words to us as weighty. Their words must be obeyed and acted upon. We must respect them because the Lord has given them to us to guide us in his ways. The fifth commandment indicates the most basic level of authority the Lord has instituted for the benefit of everyone. When children are born to parents, they are completely dependent upon them. As they grow up, they have to learn everything from their parents. It's really important that they obey their parents and listen to their good instruction because then they will also be able to flourish in their life and also become upright citizens in God's kingdom. Children need to rely on the care and good direction of their parents. This task which parents have received is a great responsibility. If it were only to involve all the physical needs of life. But it becomes even much greater when we realize that the children we have received are holy. And as it says in the baptism form, sanctified in Christ. This means that our children have received the wonderful promises of God himself. 
He has claimed them to be his very own possession. And as parents, we have the duty to train our children in righteousness and in holiness. We must speak to our children about the Lord as soon as they are able to understand. Let your home life be filled with reverence and wonder for the Lord. Teach them to love the Lord above all else and to put him in the center of their lives at a very early age. Therefore, it is so important that we model a Christian life to our children, that we attend church diligently, read and discuss the Word of God, and show that our faith is a living reality for us. As parents, we have promised that we would do this at the baptismal font. When we answered, I do, to the last question at baptism about whether we promise to instruct our children in this Christian doctrine to the utmost of our power. Boys and girls, when you have a dad and a mom who love the Lord, then you are richly blessed. When you have parents who want to fulfill their baptism vows, then you have received one of the most precious gifts of the Lord. He has given them authority over you for your good. And therefore you need to obey your parents. Listen to them without talking back or always questioning what they tell you. Listen to them and honor them because the Lord commands this and because he has given them to you for your well-being. The fifth commandment specifies each parent individually. Honor your father and your mother. Sometimes it can happen that dad is obeyed more readily than mom. We might think that we can get away with things more easily with mom. But such thoughts are very displeasing to the Lord. Mom and dad have been given equal authority. Treat both your mom and dad with the respect and honor that the Lord has said. The book of Proverbs is full of instruction which deals with the relationship between parents and children. We read part of this from chapter 23. It is necessary to train our children through firm discipline. And therefore, at times, it can be necessary also to use corporal punishment. In general, today, our society frowns on such punishments. But these words of our Lord are filled with wisdom and with truth. It is definitely true that discipline should not be done in anger or frustration, making the child a scapegoat and victim of our own problems. But discipline must be done firmly so that the child really does get the message about the importance of respecting his parents and honoring and obeying their words. When all else fails, corporal punishment is an effective way of instilling the seriousness of honoring one's parents. It is only through firm discipline that they will value and make their own the godly instruction which they receive from their parents. We read from the letter to the Ephesian church where Paul writes that fathers must be careful not to provoke their children by unreasonable demands. Such treatment makes it very difficult for a child to honor his parents as the Lord requires. Punishment and discipline, which is cruel, abusive, and arbitrary will have a very negative effect on your children. On the other hand, discipline which is non-existent, as is the case of Eli the high priest, for example, who did not discipline his sons for their wickedness, results in households where the Lord's ways are not honored and where the parents who are rightfully in authority become the ones who, in effect, are obeying their children. The roles become reversed and society totters on the brink. 
In the Catechism, we confess that we must show all honor, love, and faithfulness to our father and mother, submit with due obedience to their good instruction and discipline, and also have patience with their weaknesses and shortcomings. This can be very difficult for us as children, but this is the reality of the fallen world in which we live. There will be times when our parents are wrong, but we must still honor them and have patience with their weaknesses and shortcomings. This is something which our Lord Jesus Christ had to learn as well. How often it must have happened that he was confronted with their sins and their weaknesses. In Luke 2, we can read about how Jesus was in the temple among the teachers, listening to them, asking them questions. He had been brought to Jerusalem with his parents because they were celebrating the Passover. And when the Passover was over, his parents returned home. But Jesus stayed behind in his father's house. When his parents realized that he wasn't with them anymore, they were worried sick, and they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him everywhere. Finally, they found him in the temple. And his mother Mary said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. But surely his parents did not need to search for him because he had to be in the house of his heavenly father. That was why he had come to this earth. He had come to do the will of his father in heaven, to be busy with the things of the almighty God. Yet he obeyed his parents. And he went with them again to Nazareth and was obedient to them. He had to bear the weaknesses of parents in a way none of us will ever have to because he was perfect and never sinned. So far we have been looking at our father and mother as the ones we must honor and obey. But the fifth commandment is a summary of this aspect of life and therefore is not limited only to the obligations we owe our parents but it refers to all those whom God has placed in authority over us. We must honor, respect, and obey not only our parents, but also our teachers, office bearers in the church, our employers, and the government of the land. All these different groups of people, as they function in their specific office, have been placed over us by the Lord. They have received God-given authority, which must be respected. In Israel, the leader and teacher of a group of prophets was often called a father. There are some who also regard the father figure in certain contexts in the book of Proverbs to be a teacher rather than a biological father. Students must respect and obey their teachers because they have been set over them by the Lord. And it has pleased the Lord to use these teachers for the increase of their knowledge and their functioning in God's kingdom and in society. The fifth commandment also affects our relationships in the church. The Lord has set the overseers in authority over us as congregation members. The elders have been called by God to rule the church. Unfortunately, the spirit of the times, the lack of respect for authority in general, can also infiltrate the church. And as a result, the elders are not always treated with the respect that they should. The author of the letter to the Hebrews writes in chapter 13, Obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. The elders serve in the Church of Christ 
as ambassadors of Christ. And they come bringing the word of life, which comes from the Father in heaven. They must not serve their own interests and bring their own opinions, but they come with the word of the Lord. And therefore, they must also be received as such in the congregation. They are to be welcomed into our homes because we know that they represent the chief shepherd and are his under-shepherds. And what we confess in the Catechism also holds true for the office bearers, that we are to have patience with their weaknesses and shortcomings. None of the office bearers are perfect, but they must rather be respected and obeyed because of the position which they hold, which has been given to them by the Lord. It is not their own person as such which is so special, but the office and task that has been entrusted to them. We confess in the Belgic Confession, Article 31, that everyone must hold the ministers of the Word and the elders of the Church in special esteem because of their work and as much as possible be at peace with them without grumbling or arguing. Let us all examine ourselves. Also on this score, to see whether we truly esteem those who have been sent by God also in our midst. Do not let the influences of the world taint our regard for those in authority over us, so that we would not esteem the office bears. Such an attitude is clearly contrary to what the Lord requires from us, and he will hold us accountable for such sins. Let us rather rejoice in the work which these servants of Christ may do for the upbuilding of God's people. When there is a spirit of honor and respect, the Lord will also richly bless that, and then we as his congregation here will flourish and blossom in the rich pastures of God's word. The fifth commandment also affects how we view our employers. In Ephesians 6, the Apostle Paul sp pays special attention to the relationship between bond servants and masters. In the social situation of the time, bond servants or slaves were very common and we're often quite well treated and should not be thought of in the same way as the slaves in the United States before the Civil War, which were often badly mistreated. Paul tells employees that they must obey their employers just as sincerely and respectfully as they would obey Christ. They must not work only when their boss is looking at them, but rather they are to work from the heart as if working for the Lord himself. For the Lord always sees what we do, and he will reward those who work diligently and sincerely. In this way, we also show that we truly do respect both our employer and the Lord who is over both of us. And Paul tells the employers to treat their workers in a way which shows no partiality and in the awareness of their master in heaven who is above all and will also call the employers to account. The fifth commandment also affects how we view the government authorities in the land. Our Lord Jesus told Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor in Judea, that he did not have any authority except what he had received from God in heaven above. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans 13, verse 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. The Lord has commanded these authorities to punish the evildoer, and to use the sword for that purpose. As Christians, we have the duty to obey the government as much as possible and respect them and hold them in honor. 
when the Apostle Paul wrote these words about the government in Rome, it was a pagan government, and it would soon persecute the church of Jesus Christ. But the Roman government also provided the peace and security which helped the rapid spread of the gospel and enabled Christians to set up their congregations and communities. When we hear about our duty to obey the government and submit to its authority, we cannot help but be filled with questions when the government in so many ways clearly does not desire to uphold God's good law. In our time, thousands of babies are being aborted because the government fails to punish the evildoers who do these evil deeds. For there is no law protecting the unborn. And sins such as same-sex marriage and euthanasia have been approved by our government. And therefore it can become difficult to honor and respect the government as we should. Their shortcomings are so many. Yet we must honor even such a government and show this by paying our taxes and being upright citizens in the land. We can also show this honor by remembering them in our prayers regularly in the hope that the Lord will change the hearts of those who are in authority over us and make them see the folly of their ways. It is only when our country obeys the laws of the Lord that it can be truly blessed. There is also a limit to the authority of those whom God has set over us, they have not been given absolute authority. It can happen that our parents or the government, for example, become godless and do not want to submit to the law of the Lord. If they require that we do something that is contrary to the will of the Lord, then we must disobey them because we must obey God rather than man. That is also the importance of the phrase, in the Lord which is included in the theme of this sermon, honor your father and your mother in the Lord. The Lord commands us to honor our parents and others in authority over us because they, in turn, have the responsibility to lead us in the paths of the Lord. And so we come also to the second point, the promise of this commandment. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. From a human point of view, we owe our life to our parents. It is from our mother's womb that we have all come into this world. It has pleased the Lord to use our parents not only to help us along in the things of physical life, but also in the way of eternal life by instructing us in the ways of the Lord. That is the primary reason the Lord set them in authority over us and told us that we must honor them and listen to their teaching. We do not naturally want to do the Lord's will. We need to be taught and we need to be trained in righteousness and holiness, both as children and as parents. We never stop learning about what the Lord requires from us and how he wants us to live our lives before him. At times, as parents, the task can seem very frustrating and we can become despondent. But never forget the promises of God. He will comfort us and he will encourage us when things are difficult. He will give us the help that we need and he will see us through these trying periods. We have all made promises at the baptism font to train up our children in the ways of the Lord. We can be confident that the Lord will bless this work of training and guiding because it is work in his kingdom, work which will result in the glory of his name and the increase of his church in this world. When we diligently walk in the ways of the Lord, 
he will surely bless us. In the Old Testament times, this promise was phrased in a physical way, in terms of living long in the land which the Lord is giving the people of Israel. For a long time, they enjoyed the blessing of living in the promised land. But eventually, the sins also against the fifth commandment became so many that the Lord sent them into exile, and the good days in the land of Israel were over. Beloved in the Lord, brothers and sisters, boys and girls, may this serve also as a warning for us when we disobey our parents and reject their good teaching and instruction, the Lord will punish us. For if we persist in our rebellion, the Lord will cut us off from the blessings which he has promised to give us at our baptism. Let us rather honor our parents and all those in authority over us in the Lord. Let us heed their good instruction and grow up to be righteous and wise. We read in Proverbs 23, The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice. He who fathers a wise son will be glad in him. Let your father and mother be glad. Let her who bore you rejoice. One of the greatest treasures in the world is that parents and children share the same faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Both parents and children may then go to him seeking the forgiveness of their sins, their sins of disobedience, their sins of not always parenting as they should have. But the work of Christ on our behalf washes away all of those sins, and we may rejoice together in the Lord forever. He is the Lord and Master of us all, our great Heavenly Father in heaven. Let us together, as parents and children, obey him unceasingly and without grumbling and complaining. We may be certain that he will never be unreasonable and unfair in his laws. His commands are our delight, for when we obey him, then we can truly enjoy life to the fullest as he has intended this for us. One day we will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, and we will be made perfect, able and willing to obey him in everything, to the praise of his glory and honor forever. Amen.